Hey everybody, and welcome to our early comic review video. I'm Andy. I'm Matt. We're here with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. This is our bigger show where we show you some of the biggest and best books that are coming out this week, coming out on Wednesday, so you have a better idea when you go into your local comic book store, or you shop with us at infinityflux.net, or if you shop here at Infinity Flux, you will have a better idea of what to expect, especially because it's a weird week. It's the fifth Wednesday of the month, mm -hmm. which means... Um, Books that are normally on a pretty normal schedule, like nothing falls here. So you're going to get a lot of special one-shot issues. Uh, usually there's annuals. There's no annuals this time. Yeah. But a lot of kind of mini-series are going on, but not a whole lot of your regular scheduled yeah. uh, titles are coming out. But that's why you got to watch the show and learn a little bit more about what's coming out. So you could better be prepared. And yeah, so head on over to infinityflex.net and place your orders while we're doing this. They're live on there right now. So you don't miss out because supplies are limited. Mm -hmm. But let's get into this week because there are some pretty big books coming out this week. For sure. The first one is Wolverine Revenge number three. Three of five. And that's going to be important. I'll talk about it in a second. So this is written by Jonathan Hickman, art by Greg Capullo. And I actually don't have a lot to say about this issue because there's not a lot of dialogue in this. There's not a lot of heavy plot in this. This is just Wolverine continuing his quest for revenge. Tracking down Omega Red, tracking down Deadpool and Colossus, and taking them all on. Now, that's still one at a time. He, mm -hmm. he faces off against one, finds the other, and then finds the other, and deals with them all. We do learn a little something about the Earth's last remaining power source, which has been kind of the MacGuffin of this whole series. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be interested to see how they work that into the rest of the story. I don't even know if it's really going to come up again or not. But uh, there was a little something about that that, that we learned. Um, but this is this issue is actually written in a way that makes it feel like it's the end of the series. Like if you didn't read the last two issues, you would think it was pretty cool. But there are still two more issues. Yeah. So when number four and number five come out, we'll be definitely be talking about those. Um, but yeah, that's why I said this is three of five. Don't think this is the end because when you read it, you might think, oh, that was it. But no, there's there's two more after this. Um, now, we do have the uh, the regular version here. There is also the red band version. Uh, we looked at both of these, and uh, what we can tell you is there. I didn't see any panels that were any different mm -hmm. whatsoever. However, there are two extra pages in this, and they're like big splash pages. So let's say it's kind of they're kind of similar in why they're there. Yeah, it's more of um, uh, the fallout from from fights, or a little bit more like finality to certain characters yeah it definitely doesn't change the story you don't even get any extra dialogue or anything like that it's just two extra full splash pages that are pretty graphic by standard marvel yeah. standards uh standard so marvel standards. yeah so if you want to pay the extra dollar for a couple extra pages of um just cool greg capullo artwork and i don't know why you wouldn't uh you know that then grab this one but if you don't need that then you can it's a dollar cheaper so uh, to go along with that, though, so uh, this is our A cover right here. And like I said, we do have the red band version as well. We have this um, uh, Mastrazzo variant. Now, this is a variant of the regular version. Uh, we also have this nice uh, Bresson variant. Again, this is a variant of the regular version. And then we have the um, 1 in 25 Oh, shoot, I didn't get the artist on. Oh, this is Ryan Stegman. Holy Stegman. cow, yeah, Ryan Stegman. Uh, 1 in 25 that we're selling for $25. And again, this is a variant of the regular version. And then we do have the 1 in 25 variant of the red band version. So these these are the only two red bands right here. Everything else is the regular version. Uh, and we're selling this one for $45.99. Yeah, it's... So, if you've been getting the red band ones, you know, cool, continue with that if you've been getting the regular ones. But I, the the changes between the two versions, it's getting less and less as yeah. it goes on. more and more minimal. More yeah. and more minimal. And so, like, yeah, it's cool that there's a couple extra pages, but it doesn't change the overall story. So, don't feel like you have to get the red band, especially if it sells out or something. Yeah. Okay, next up, I have a new one. This is, it happened on Hyde Street Devour one-shot. So this is set within the 
Hyde Street universe that has only just begun. We've only got one issue of Jeff Johns and Ivan Rice's Hyde Street, but that doesn't matter. It's already time for a one shot to tie in with that. But I say that in a good way because there's so much cool stuff that was set up in issue number one. I I want one of these for every one of the characters that was yeah, that would be really cool. teased in the uh, end of that book. <clears throat> but of course, Hyde Street is this street that uh, is kind of supernatural. Apparently, you can kind of stumble into it from whatever town you're in. You make a wrong turn, you end up on Hyde Street. And it's kind of sinister, and there's these characters there that we don't quite know what they are. But we know they kind of uh, are in a contest of gathering souls. And there's like a leaderboard and everything. Well, we got introduced to a couple in the first issue, but this one introduces us to a new one. But if you had read that number one, you could still read this and still get a lot out of it. So this is by Maytel Shoot and uh, the artist by Layla Lees, who I love. And we meet a woman who's walking down the street, clearly has stumbled her way onto Hyde Street. And she's not very happy with her body after she's had her daughter. And something on Hyde Street calls out to her because there is a store there uh, called Fat Free. And it's kind of like your uh, your supplement store yeah. or your you know uh, health food store, that kind of thing. She goes in there and just looking around and she's greeted by Miss Goodbody who is here on the cover. And she's one of our, you don't know if they're demons or what kind of entities they are. I don't know are. what they are. Yeah. Um, but she offers her, she kind of uh, says like, oh, you're not happy with the way you look. And the woman says, well, no, I would like to look better. And she's like, well, I've got the perfect thing for you. She hands her this right here, which is called Devour. And it's, you don't quite know if it's like pills or if it's, you know, mm -hmm. powder you put and stuff. But she says, this will solve all your problems. Now, this is all really interesting. We see like, uh, her interact with her daughter and kind of shame her daughter for wanting to eat some cookies but she's going to be taking this devour but the real twist happens and it's not it it happens pretty early on so it's not like it ruins a story or anything it's not a spoiler but there is a time jump to her granddaughter who is getting married and is uh maybe not fitting in her wedding dress as well as she would like but her mom and grandmother are there and they think maybe she should be taking the devour that they've been taking for so long. And they're basically at this point, skin and bones. Mm. So in this, you're going to have to see how does she end up giving into this devour? What is it doing? Why does it make those who take it have this like ravenous hunger? That's very like disturbing and everything. And you do find out like not exactly what devour is, but you truly see it at the end. So, a very creepy one-shot. Kind of a Twilight Zone. I was going to say, it definitely has those vibes. It reminds me of an episode of Smallville, too. I think this, <laughs> something similar happened. But, yeah. So, this could definitely stand on its own just as kind of a one-shot horror uh, weird tale. But also, it helps build the, um, the universe of Hyde Street. You do see a couple of the characters in the background from Hyde Street that you know, shows you that you are set within that world. Yeah, nothing major, just like, no. oh, hey, there's so-and-so and so-and-so, yeah. and it uh, makes it feel like it's all cohesive. Right, and, you know, I like this because that's another character we know that's one of these entities from Hyde Street, and maybe she'll pop up in that yeah. book again. She's yeah, we saw seen it a little bit, but... Yeah, we know. saw her name on the scoreboard, too, yeah. at the end of the first issue of Hyde Street. So I think this is super cool. Hopefully everyone who checked out Hyde Street will grab this. And yeah, once again, as we always say, Ghost Machine is killing it. Mm -hmm. All their books are awesome. And this is another one. And just a one shot. I believe it's a little oversized. I'm not sure exactly how many pages. But how much it, is it? Uh, it is $5.99. Yeah, it's a little oversized. It's a little oversized and well worth it. So that is your A cover. We also have a... Layla Lees, that's your interior artist. You can see the granddaughter on her wedding. And we have a uh, an incentive. I can't remember this. I think it's a 1 in 10 or 1 in 25. But this is a Gary Frank cover. We were selling for uh, $11.99. 
All right. Well, next I've got Poison Ivy Swamp Thing Feral Trees. This is a one like shot. That, one thing I've got Poison Ivy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, don't touch me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm gonna see here. Uh, so yeah, Poison Ivy Swamp Thing Feral Trees number one. Although it says number one, this is actually just a one shot. This is written by G Willow Wilson, and the art is by Mike Perkins. And in this, the trees are in pain. They're protecting themselves from anyone who gets too close. And you'll see, well, I was going to say, and this leads to five people going missing in Crest Hill Woods just outside of Gotham City. You'll see how they protect themselves at the very beginning of the book. Because people are go missing, people are going missing, and you will see how and why that is as you read through the book. So the Parliament of Trees has reached out to Poison Ivy and Swamp Thing to investigate this and to make their way to the heart of the wilderness to try to find out what, what is causing this, what is going on. So they do that. They go into the woods, but they quickly find out that the trees are not listening to them. It's not obeying the commands of Swamp Thing. You know, he's trying to tell them what to do, and they're just, it's just, he has no control whatsoever. Um, so deeper into their mystery, Poison Ivy does get a glimpse of what the source of the pain is and then over the course of the book they try to just piece this story together these these flashes that she's having they try to piece all these images together uh it's it's pretty interesting i, I won't tell you how it all shakes out obviously but uh like i said it's a one shot this feels like it kind of came out of nowhere and it does feature poison ivy and swamp thing they go really well together but we don't ever see them together that often uh, so it's kind of cool to see them together. And they're also the only characters in the entire book, except for a couple other of the, like the Parliament of Trees characters, which are, are Swamp Thing-like, you know, and that they kind of, they look like they've been, you know, devoured by the green and everything. Uh, but other than a couple of those guys, this is all Poison Ivy and Swamp Thing as they try to, uh, you know, f figure out this mystery. It's not really action heavy or anything like that. It's just, it's just more story driven. But it's really, really cool. I think if you're a fan of Poison Ivy or Swamp Thing, you're definitely going to want to check this out. Uh, especially if you're a fan of G. Willow Wilson's current Poison Ivy run. It's been running for 26, 7, 8 issues now. Then I think this will definitely uh, pique your interest and will be a nice addition to that collection if you've been getting those. So we have our A cover right here. And there's a couple cool variants. This is a really neat Clayton Crane variant. I like that a lot. This is a... Um, uh, uh, Jessica Fong. And then we have this, uh, shoot, I don't have the, probably, I think this might be a 1 in 25. I'm I not too sure. I think Ashley Wood. Oh, yeah, Ashley. I was trying to figure out the ratio. Yeah, oh, Ashley yeah. Wood. I'm not sure what the ratio is on this. I think maybe it's 1 in 25, but we're selling this one for twenty four ninety nine. That's a cool one. I like that small thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I read that book uh, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. but... From what I remember, it basically all takes place like basically in one night or something. Yeah, right? it's not. It's, yeah, it's not a big sprawling mystery. They just go into the woods and try to figure out. Yeah, I like that for a one shot. Yeah, just like kind of a one moment that can fit between issues. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, next up, I have Batman: The Long Halloween, The Last Halloween, Number Two, continuing this uh, new mini series that jumps back into the world of the Long Halloween. Uh, that version of Gotham and Batman and everything. So this issue, since every issue is going to be by a different artist, they're all written by Jeff Loeb, but different artists. This one is drawn by Klaus Janssen. And after the uh, disappearance of uh, James Gordon Jr. in the last issue, plus we saw Batman found a body and it had this gun next to it. And, you know, there was... What I like about this is this is very much Detective Batman. Yeah, you're getting the clues as Batman gets them, and you can try to piece it together as well. That's what I. That's one of my favorite things about Long Halloween is it's a lot of detective work. Yeah. I really like that. And that continues in this because Batman is taking Robin to Arkham Asylum for the first time. Not like here's you know come on boy it's yeah. time to <laughs> go to Arkham Asylum, but Batman wants to go in there and basically interrogate Mad Hatter because. I feel like at this point, Batman's kind of grasping at straws. He's like, well, Mad Hatter stole Barbara Gordon at one point and made her Alice in his twisted world. So maybe he has something to do with her her brother going missing. So he's going in there, but on the way, uh, you know, Robin's kind of interested in like, wow, you put all these people behind bars in here and gets distracted because he uh, sees Calendar Man. And I won't give away that interaction, but it's very interesting. And you know 
the significance of Calendar Man to the long Halloween lore. Plus, uh, there's someone else there that, uh, that was in the first issue that is a nice follow-up on that, but I'm not going to give it away. But it is also mentioned in this that it's getting close to Thanksgiving. And, oh. you know, there's, there's kind of the feeling of, is this another holiday killer? And, you know, watch out because there's another holiday coming up. And uh, you'll have to read it to see how this goes. But all the clues that Batman finds kind of uh, seem like they are to make Batman look bad. Or mm. maybe that Batman is who's behind it all. Um, there's a couple of different characters it focuses on in this one. Uh, one of the main ones is Penguin, which is really cool. And how he factors into this. Uh, I, I just love... You know, just like the original Long Halloween, it each issue kind of had a, a rogues gallery character that oh, was yeah. surrounding it. And that's the great part about it is this is so much about Batman and his villains. So you get a bunch of classic ones in this one as well. So another great issue. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. And uh, no one is safe in here. I'll say that. Mm. That, you know, this is its own universe, its own Long Halloween-verse. And uh, not every character makes it out of this. So there is your A cover by the original artist, Tim Sale. We also have this Klaus Janssen variant cover with Penguin. And we have this beautiful J. Scott Campbell variant, which I love the colors because that's very reminiscent of Long Halloween. Yeah. Uh, but Poison Ivy is not in this issue. Huh. Yeah, I like uh, that we have this, and we also have Batman and Robin Year One yeah. go at the same time. So we have two different books that take place in Batman and Robin's early days, yeah. you know, or or I guess the early days of their partnership. Anyway, I think that's neat. Uh, all right, next up we've got Big Dwellings, Boy. All Hallows Eve special. This is another one shot, written and drawn by Jay Stevens, as are all the other Dwellings books. Uh, but this one is very spooky. Now I don't, I don't. I'm going to say I don't think these are kids like it's it's drawn in a very cartoony scott like even more cartoony than peanuts i would say yeah you know i don't think they're kids i think they're, supposed, they're all supposed to be adults young adults but they, they look like kids just because of the way they're drawn they're kind of little chibi versions. yeah little chibi characters. versions uh you know you can see on the cover they all everything looks so cute well i guess not everything looks cutesy right but um <laughs> gives the initial impression of cutesy. yeah uh definitely not for kids this is definitely you know rated mature for you know this is for adults only uh, but this is about a guy named, I was going to say kid. It's not, he's not a kid. <laughs> it's about a guy named Wolfgang Legant. He is convinced that he is a seasoned vampire hunter. And he arrives in Elwich, which is the town, you know, it's like this book's South Park or, you know, <laughs> Springfield or whatever. Uh, but he arrives in Elwich to drive a stake through the town's thriving sangu uh, sanguinarian goth subculture. And I guess sanguinarians, I don't really... Like they they use little bits of blood to satiate themselves, I guess, because uh, he wants to, he's a, he thinks he's a vampire hunter. He wants to take out all the vampires, right? But he does meet a young woman named Emmeline Mementa who believes that she's a real vampire, and um, her faith may be the only thing capable of stopping a mass murder in the making. Uh, this there's a lot of uh you know pretty graphic imagery in this book but it is a nice uh book to read right around this time of the year especially with halloween being just a few days away like this will be a great book to get like the day before halloween uh but yeah it's it's hard to describe because everything looks so cutesy but then you see what's actually in it uh, there's a little bit of nudity which is kind of weird and there's definitely a lot of blood and gore and that kind of stuff but uh, if you like the other Dwellings books and you know what to expect, then I recommend this because it's just another really cool, uh, really cool addition to that whole you know franchise, if you will. Yeah, it's definitely carved out its own like look and feel for a, a comic that yeah. I haven't seen anyone like even try to copy yeah. something like this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so that is our A cover right there, and then we have this nice uh, Katie S. Skelly variant, and that is Emmeline. That's your, that's your, uh, sort of one of the main characters of the book. She's an adult there. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's more, that's, that's a closer representation of probably what they are. Not these, uh, cutesy little, not <laughs> cute ones. It's not in focus, but you can see they're tiny little characters there. It's just, uh, I've read a few of these and it's just, is every time it gets me like these look like young kids <laughs> doing all these terrible things. Okay. Next up, I have a new book 
This is from Mad Cave, and this is The Hexiles. Number one, this is by written by Cullen Bunn, and the art is by Joe Bacardo. And uh, this is really cool. Another weird, spooky book. And uh, a lot of this issue is set up, but that, that was kind of in the solicitation, but it was really nice to read it kind of fleshed out. So there's seven siblings that uh, didn't know that each other existed, and they all get an invite to their father's funeral. None of them knew their father, and, you know, they kind of, when they all get there, they kind of joke around like, well, he really got around, and, mm. did you, you know, did you ever hear from him? No, I never, you know, uh, I used to get, like, a bag of candy on my birthday that my mom said it was from my dad, but it was actually her giving. So, like, this dad had no contact yeah. with these kids. They all had different mothers. But he has died, and, uh, you know, it doesn't really say why they all showed up. You know, some... Uh, clearly came there to see, is there a will? Like, did this weird old guy leave us, like, a mansion or a huge inheritance or anything like that? Some are just curious about, like, who was this man? Um, they're not alone in the parlor that they're, you know, at the funeral home. But the other people there are, you know, they do say, oh, it looks like he has friends. But they're very weird. They're mm. very um, kind of blank-faced, everything. That does play a bit into it later. But as they're all talking and everything, some are like, ah, I'm going to leave. There's, there's nothing here or whatever. And uh, the, the, the people are very, the kids are very, very different from each other and their personalities and how they were brought up. But a strange, tall, very creepy man shows up and basically says like, oh, you've all figured out, you know, this is your father. And uh, they, they, they're the ones they ask him like, hey, is, was he rich? Like, is there anything? And they're like, he was like, no, um, he was very popular and had a lot of influence, but he didn't have two pennies to, to mm. pinch together. Um, but, you know, he did leave you something. And someone's like, oh, probably a lot of debt. And he's like, well, kind of. He said, you know, to get so famous and everything in life, he made some deals. And they're like, deals with the devil? He's like, well, a few devils. And it turns out that... Uh, they didn't reveal it to each other, but each of these uh, siblings has a special ability. And uh, they felt, I put it in my notes, very Doctor Strange. Okay. It's like the something of somebody. Oh, okay, like, yeah. it, but like um, one can turn into like this demon monster and uh, one can like give someone like, like change their emotional state. Like they're all... But they all have names that are kind of like Doctor Strange yelling out yeah. something. Uh, but because of all these, it's time to pay for them. So basically their father uh, made these deals and they're the currency for it. And they're coming to basically claim collect, that back. Yeah. Come to collect. So that is kind of the setup of this book. It does go in a little bit further. I'm not going to get into it because it was really cool. The art in this is... Uh, very dark, very kind of the scratchy look of it, um, but works really well in this. Uh, it's really cool to see the like the different powers because it's a pretty like gothic kind of kind of story to begin with. When they start doing that, it's like oh, th some of these are really like one can like summon like this like lobster demon that like is kind of wise cracking and stuff. It's really cool. Cullen Bunn does a great job with these kind of books, but. Definitely check out The Hexiles. I feel like this is going to be a really fun... I'm not sure how many issues it's going to be, but it uh, definitely sets the stage for some really cool stuff. Is that from Mad Cave? Yep, Mad yeah, Cave. Yeah, they have a lot of good horror stuff. So that is our only cover as well. All right, well, next up, I've got Phases of the Moon Knight number three. Now, unlike the other two issues of this series, this one actually has three different stories of... Well... It's three different stories, but two of them are, uh, just like the other issues, different Moon Knights from different times. The first one is called Moon Knight Chan. This is written and drawn by Yuji Kaku, who created the uh, Hell's Paradise manga. And it's a short story about two young girls whose father hurt them, and one of them is given the powers of Moon Knight. Uh, and she calls herself Moon Knight, a.k.a. Lunatic Angel, which is pretty cool. And it's not really... Um, it's not a very long story whatsoever, but it, it, it is definitely, it looks like manga with the, the character designs, the giant word balloons, and the big font. Like, everything about it screams manga, and it's really cool to see. There's one there's one part, it, just to give you sort of the uh, uh, an idea of what the feel of it is like, she cuts the head off a bad guy, 
but then does this cutesy, like, I've come to save you with the power of love and justice. You know, she strikes this pose. But everybody's standing around her mortified, going, oh, my gosh, somebody call 911. This is horrible. But she's like, yeah, I defeated the bad guy. You know, so that, you know, just to give you an idea of what that story is like. Um, the second one is called The Past is Present. This is written by Justina Ireland and the artist by Daniel Bayless. And this is set in the not-too-distant future in a, I would describe it as a mildly post-apocalyptic America where a virus has ravaged everything. Um, it's about a girl named Ellie. She lives with her parents in this museum of heroes that's just outside of the containment zone. And these bad guys break in and kill her parents. And they wound her too, but Khonshu appears and gives her the powers of uh, one of his fists. You know, I don't want to say the powers of Moon Knight because she actually becomes the new Hunter's Moon. Uh, you know, so, you know, from Jed McKay's run, we know we have Moon Knight and Hunter's Moon, and they're the two fists of Khonshu. So she becomes the new uh, Hunter's Moon, and she has a really cool costume design, which is not on any of the variant covers, which I think which is kind of weird. Yeah, uh, I really like her design, though. So she, obviously she uses her new power to get revenge, on the guys who killed her parents. Um, it does have a pretty definitive ending. You know, a lot of times books like this will say the end question mark. <laughs> this just says the end. Um, so I don't know if she'll pop back up in any other book. I kind of wouldn't mind that because she seemed like a, a really cool character. And it's the first time we've seen a different Hunter's Moon. Mm -hmm. Normally we've seen a bunch of different Moon Knights, but never a different Hunter's Moon. So I re that was probably, I would call the main story. It was the longest one. It's right there in the middle there. And then... There is a uh, there's a mini Marvels story by Chris Giarusso who does a lot of the mini Marvels variants, uh, and this is set back when Moon Knight was dead and Shroud was masquerading as Moon Knight in the in the black during the it was the Vengeance of Moon Knight mm -hmm. miniseries where he was all in the black suit and it's funny because five large pizzas are delivered to the Midnight Mission uh, and the delivery guy says these are for Moon Knight and Tigra and Reese and, and Soldier and Hunter's Moon Knight well he's you know, he's dead. And then Shroud comes in, dresses Moon Knight, and goes, nope, I'm definitely Moon Knight. And they don't believe him. He's like, no, it's definitely me. Those are definitely my pizzas. And it's just, it's a fun little, you know, I think it's like a four-page story. But other characters want the pizza as well. So they dress up as Moon Knight uh, and try to get the pizzas. And we actually see um, different colored Moon Knights. Like, there's one in all blue called... Uh, uh, blue moon there's a there's red moon there's harvest moon <laughs> like it's really funny all these cutesy little like different color moon nights all trying to get this pizza it's just a really fun story so you know it's it's nice uh <clears throat> um you know it's a nice little uh juxtaposition to the other two stories in this and chris jerusa has been doing those great um there's the a cover of venom war but then he does yes. the variants yeah. they're the same thing but in his style yeah his so cutesy really style cute. Yeah, so I, I would have loved to have seen this like wedged in the middle of one of those Vengeance of the Moon Knight issues in his cute style. You know, just it was really fun. So uh, if you've been getting the first two issues, uh, don't miss this one. I think there's one or two more after this as well. But that is your uh, Moon Knight, aka Lunatic Girl. That's sort of the anime style of Moon Knight. Uh, so there's that's your A cover right there, and she's the one that's on all these. So well, actually, this is a different character that shows up in that story, and I don't want to. You'll you'll see you'll understand when you read it. But this is by uh, Tao, and then this is the uh, also uh, features uh, that same character, and this is from Yuji Kaku, who that's your interior artist on that first story. So uh, it looked really cool. Well, next up, I've got another one shot. Like we said, this is the fifth Wednesday of the month, so we're getting a lot of one shots mm -hmm. uh, coming out, and especially this time of year, they're uh, usually spooky. Yeah. So this one is "Come Find Me," an autumnal offering this is uh from distillery and this is kind of a horror anthology although i would say i don't want to say it's like horror horror like a lot of the the books we've been getting this definitely has more of the like fall time uh you know a little bit more mystical creepy that kind of stuff uh it's there's no like slashers in this or anything mm -hmm. like that i would say most of them are kind of period pieces like either medieval or something like that. So there's various creators in here. It's kind of spearheaded by Becky Cloonan, who I love. I love her writing. I love her art. We also have uh, Vanessa Del Rey. We have Ian e. Carroll and more. Uh, I think there's six tales in this one. And they vary from pretty traditional comic book uh, panel layouts to, uh, you know, you have the art all around and then the text kind of runs through yeah. it and it's a little bit... Um, 
like poetry, that kind of thing. So a wide variety of stories in here. <clears throat> I'll tell you about a kind of highlight on the Becky Cloonan one because that was awesome. So in that one, there it's the story of a woman who seems to be new to the job of grave robbing. She's working with a guy who uh, they go to a grave that was just recently, and it's like a, a, a mausoleum, it's an above ground, and it kind of takes place in medieval times. And his excuse is basically like, well, they're adorned with all of these ornaments and everything that they're not going to use, so what's the big deal with us taking them? And so he starts taking stuff, but she takes the coin out of the body's mouth which is kind of a no-no, even in the grave robber sense. But just then, the soldiers show up, and they run off, and she still has the coin. And this is kind of about the the weight of that coin she has and how it starts to uh, mess with her life and maybe ends up... That, that sounds very silver coin. Very silver yeah. coin, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, where that goes, it does get a little supernatural, but it's very creepy, Uh just cool art, very dark, um, but I love the setting and Becky Clinton's art in that. It was amazing. Um, there's another story about music and almost someone who is trying to uh, achieve more with music than is even like possible and maybe a human body can make music. It's a very creepy uh, opening story to this. Uh, I, I felt like it had notes of Sandman, of a vertigo title indie horror that's what you can expect from this book so uh, if that sounds like your jam this was a cool one for that very different art styles very different writing styles uh, all in one so that is your a cover by becky cluna if you can't really tell here it's not really embossed but it's a uh, spot gloss on the black yeah, yeah it does which look is good. really cool mm -hmm. we also have this cover this is the um hamlet machine uh, cover that is your artist on the one about music that's your first story in there we've got a uh, Tula Lotte variant and we also have this this is a uh, I'm not sure I think uh, maybe a 1 in 10 uh, cover and I'm not sure let's see who the artist is on this one this is the Jen Ellie variant so it kind of looks like it, yeah it's a very cool almost like corpse bride style we're selling like i said for 1999 <clears throat> all right well i've got another entry into the venom war because that thing is still going on this is a venom war fantastic four this is a one shot as well uh, this is written by adam warren and the artist by joey vasquez and this is a little bit less about what's going on in the venom war and the symbiotes and all that stuff. And it's actually more about Kang and Doctor Doom playing like a chess match against each other. They have both played small but pretty vital roles in the current Venom series. It's been running for the last couple of years. Um, and like I said, this issue is them trying to one-up each other, trying to, you know, Doctor Doom will, will do something, but Kang says, well, I, you know, I have already accounted for that because I knew that he was going to do that. And it's very, you know, 4D chess, or for them, it's probably like 7D chess or something like that. But um, Kang uses a time-displaced Fantastic Four to fight against Fan the uh, Doctor Doom. And they, they don't really know what's going on, uh, you know, at, at first. Obviously, Reed Richards figures it out. Um, I will say there is a lot of time travel and time travel gibberish in this. <laughs> like, you could play a drinking game with how many times they use the word Kronos or Chrono. Everything is chrono. Like it's like that scene in in Ant Man where he's like, "You guys put the quantum in front of everything. Everything in this Johnny is chrono." This chrono trigger. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chrono, chrono, everything. <laughs> uh, so a lot of time travel stuff. It was a little bit hard to keep up with, but uh, it's still cool seeing you know Kang and the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom all kind of mixing it up. Are there any symbiotes in this? Yeah, there are because because uh, earlier in the series Kang had manipulated the uh, rascal symbiote which is um red goblin mm. and dr doom had had sort of planted these ideas in um flexo 
uh, you know, back in World War II era and said, one day you're going to do this. Well, all of that comes to a head in this. Mm -hmm. So the symbiotes are there, but they're using them as tools against each other. Oh, okay. And then Kang pulls in the Fantastic Four and like sticks them in like a five minute time loop or something. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of time travel stuff, but uh, it was still pretty cool. You know, like you could probably just read this without the Venom War stuff and you probably still understand it. So just wanted to uh, tell you about that. So that's the a, that's the only cover we have is the A cover. But in place of the variants for this, I do just want to let you know that Venom War Zombie Oats number three is out this week as well. Uh, this is just wrapping up this mini series of She-Hulk, Hellcat, Shocker, Boomerang, all those guys, uh, you know, sort of stuck in the bar with no name fighting against Zombie Oats. So that is out this well. So don't miss it if you got the other two. That's the A cover to that one. And then this is the variant by uh, Woo, any Woo. Uh, with uh, She-Hulk and um, Shocker. Shocker. Yeah. Next up, I've got another one shot. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, so this is Penguin Special number one. This is mostly a collection of kind of classic Penguin-centered stories. It even says at the bottom, like, it's because of the Penguin show that is fantastic going on right mm. now. I'm not completely caught up. I'm about... I think I'm an episode behind, but it is great. So I did, like, this made me excited to read this. Yeah. Uh, I haven't watched Penguin. But most of this is reprints, but the first story in it is a new story called Mr. Cobb by Jeremy Adams, who I love, and the art is by Howard Porter. And this is interesting. I would say this most closely ties in with Tom King's Penguin series. Uh, and... In such a way that I have not read Tom King's Penguin series. I want to, uh, especially now after reading this. But there was something I guess was a spoiler in this that I didn't know was a spoiler until mm. I started looking it up and I realized that. Uh, so I will avoid certain things in this. But essentially, uh, there's a, an apartment and there is a woman there named Madeline who is uh, pretty comatose. She's in a wheelchair uh, just in a haze, and she has a nurse that takes care of her, uh, and apparently this is someone to Penguin as he comes in and uh, checks in on her. But this nurse they have apparently uh, figured out that the medication that was been giving to Madeline was, uh, he says, basically like horse tranquilizers to her, and actually he adjusted her medication and she should be back to normal in not too long. Uh, but apparently Penguin wanted her like this, mm. and you'll have to read it to find out why. But let's say it doesn't go well for that nurse who uh, he thought he was doing something good. And yeah, it's pretty crazy. And I do wonder what's going to spin out of this. Yeah. Uh, but I did think it was really interesting, and Jeremy Adams is a great writer. Howard Porter's art on this is really cool. Uh, so yeah, that is your... Uh, original story in here. It's, you know, I don't know how many pages, six, eight pages, something like that. And then we also have um, the first appearance of Penguin uh, collected in here, along with the Seeger Origin special about Penguin and Joker's Asylum from 10, 15 years ago uh, that spotlighted Penguin as well. So kind of through the years, uh, stories about Penguin and his origin and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so this is a five ninety nine book. Um, so if you think it's worth it, uh, just for that short story, cool. Especially if you've read that Penguin mini series, or if you've never read some of those, his first appearance, all of that. Uh, this is also really nice, but it is oversized because of all of those stories in there. So and it's just the one cover. I don't think I've ever read his first appearance. If I'm thinking about no, it, no, and I don't remember what it is because it doesn't say right off what it is, but. You know, you get into it and, you know, it looks like, you know, your classic. Yeah, definitely Golden Age. Golden Age story, which is really fun. But yeah, it doesn't actually say. I like that artwork in that first story. Oh, yeah, Harry Porter. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it doesn't say what issue number. I could have looked it up, but you can do that at home. I feel like we should have known that. For Penguin's first appearance, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I really should know. I have no idea. Leave us a comment. Let us know for sure. Yep. Next, I've got Predator versus Black Panther <clears throat> number three. There's not a lot to say about this. We're right in the middle of this miniseries right now, and it's just continuing uh, Black Panther's fight against the uh, the Yautjas, which is the, the Predators. Wakanda's fight against them. You know, everybody's kind of uh, divided up. Black Panther's doing his thing. We've got Shuri. I'm sorry. 
uh, yeah, Shuri, mm -hmm. just outside of the uh, the protective dome around Wakanda that the Yachas have activated. Um, so yeah, just continuing, the, the Yachas are getting closer and closer to the main store of, of, of vibranium in Wakanda. That's kind of a, you know, not such a good thing. And Black Panther's just trying to figure out a way to take them down. But I will say that at the end, and no, I'm not going to spoil it, but at the end, another character shows up kind of out of nowhere to help them. It's a character that's not really, you know, tied to Wakanda or Black Panther, but it is cool that that character did show up because now it's like, oh, what, how's that character yeah. going to go up against uh, a, a Predator? So that's going to be really cool. So yeah, I just wanted to let you know that number three is out. If you've been buying this mini series, I don't miss this one. So there's our A cover, and then we have this uh, uh, Bresson cover. And this won't fit on the stand, but I did <laughs> want to uh, put this earlier in the show because this is DC versus Marvel Omnibus. And this comes out this week. We've been waiting forever for this. Forever, yeah. So <laughs> this is it's not cheap. It's $150. But this collects basically every time that the Marvel and DC Universe uh, met. So you have stuff like, let's see, we've got uh, Uncanny X-Men with uh, New Teen Titans, Batman, Punisher, Lake of Fire, Dark Side versus Galactus, The Hunger, Spider-Man, Batman, Green Lantern, Silver Surfer. Incredible Hulk, Superman. You know, you've got all of those classic... Uh, going to the early days with Spider-Man and Superman. I was going to say, I think it has that. that in it, right? That's the first one from 1978. Yeah, so it's got all of that in here. This is a thing that, you know, you've got two big companies that are, you know, rivals for the most part. But this is something that, like, we never thought we'd get because of the, the rights issues between the two companies. Yeah. Who would distribute it? Who would, you know, whose name would be on the top of it? All that kind of stuff. So they are only doing like one printing of this. Uh, so don't miss out on it. Plus, there's two versions of it. There is the regular cover that's got the, uh, is it a George Perez? I um, believe so, yeah. And then we have this exclusive one. Uh, this is the like direct market edition that is the Jim Lee cover. And, you know, Jim Lee is one of the editor-in-chiefs at uh, DC, but has a great history with Marvel but who knows if we'll ever see him draw Marvel characters officially ever again. But you've got them on this cover. So you've got Jim Lee drawing Batman and Wolverine. On the back, you've got Deathstroke and Hulk. Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil yeah. All of that. So don't miss out on this because once it's gone, it's gone while supplies last. Yeah, I don't we, see this ever getting reprinted again, ever. No, we have a limited supply of them as well. So this is one you do not want to miss out on. Because, I mean, some of those... Good luck finding some of those comics that are collected in mm -hmm. here. Super rare, especially that uh, Superman, Spider-Man, all that kind of stuff. So I can't wait to crack into my copy of it and read all of those. But yep, $150, but well worth it. Well, next, I've got Deadpool team up number three. I don't even have any notes on this one because this whole issue is basically <laughs> just Wolverine and Deadpool versus Hulk. I mean, that's yeah. really it. I get the whole issue is them. Not that that's a, necessarily a bad thing, but I mean, there's not. Um, I will say it doesn't really push the story forward. That's, you know, the story of this. Even physically. Uh, they're, ba they're basically in this, oh, right. yeah, there's an, this entire time. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the story doesn't really get pushed forward. You know, the, the, the main story is they've gone to this other realm. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, mm -mm. But um, it has a name. Yeah, it's where it's Chris, where Star Chris Star lives. But they're looking for these dragon eggs that uh, Deadpool can take back to the Yakuza so they can get off of his back. Like, there is a plot to the miniseries, but this doesn't... This barely uh, focuses on that at all. And it's just a big old slugfest between the Hulk and Deadpool and Wolverine on it's the other side. Between Hulk and Wolverine, like, uh, I think Deadpool says, like, I'll do some cover fire. Yeah, I'll let you soften him up, basically. Yeah, and so you just get a big, like, Wolverine-Hulk fight. And, uh... You know, this is Rob Liefeld. If you're a fan, you've got, you know, this is like a best of Liefeld. You've got all of the poses, all of the, you know, the things you expect from mm -hmm. a Liefeld book. But I will say it is a lot of fun because it, oh, it's yeah. just it's just nonsense Marvel action 
uh, that you really don't get anywhere else. Nonsense in a good way, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can check your brain at the door and just watch these two, three characters slug each other There's for 20 pages. There's a two-page spread of Hulk's face. face. Yeah. This shit's <laughs> like, you turn them and you're like, whoa. Yeah. I was not expecting that. Yeah, not a two-page spread of the Hulk, of his face from yeah. the collarbone <laughs> up uh, across two pages. Yeah, so it's just, it's a crazy issue. I made notes on it, but it's all my notes are just like, that was crazy. Yeah. Like, you know, Hulk immediately appears and just is like, I was doing good. Why'd you do this? And they immediately start yep. fighting. Yep. Like, it, there's there's not a whole lot of uh, reasons for why they are doing what they're doing. Yeah. Other than it's just fun to watch. Definitely is not the same as like in Thor Ragnarok where Thor's like, oh, it's a friend from work. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see him. No, they go, they go at it for the whole time. So that, that's it. You know, we don't even, I don't even have another cover to show you. It's just this. It's Wolverine and Hulk. Chris Starr gets in there a little bit. Deadpool gets in there a little bit, but it's mostly Wolverine and Hulk fighting each other. So there you go. And there is set up for another character showing up at the very end. A couple more, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm actually excited about the next one. Yeah. I, I like that character. Okay, next up, I've got Amazing Spider-Man number 60. So this is our final issue of Zeb Wells writing Amazing Spider-Man. We know, uh, you know, we're going on after this with the Eight Deaths of Spider-Man storyline. It's going to have a couple of different writers on it. And just in case you're wondering, it's not getting renumbered after this. Like, this is still continuing. It's yeah. just Zeb Wells' is, uh, final issue here. Yes. So, uh, in this, if you've been reading it, you've got all this stuff with Tombstone. Uh, there was the trial that went on. That didn't go so well. But now it's going back to trial after that big slugfest between Tombstone and Spider-Man. And that's kind of the where they wrap up this storyline, which is... Uh, only just a couple of pages, really. Yeah, it's not very long. It's not very long. She hulks there again. Um, and then suddenly there is a big fight with Sandman, which is, it kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. It's fun. And there's some big Sandman moments. But basically all of Zeb Wells' run is, I don't want to say it is wrapped up here, because it's not. Just bits of this story are wrapped up here. It's not like, oh, the whole cast from the whole thing is brought back in R that right. story. Now, I guess the status quo persists. Yes. But it's just not going to be him writing it going forward. Yeah, but uh, he did introduce a lot of characters and storylines in Zeb Wells he, in his run. And that is spread off through a couple of different stories in here because it is an oversized issue with uh, a story with Wreck Rap, the crazy, uh, uh, weird mutant Spider-Man demon thing. Uh, with art by Ed McGinnis, who did most of that character's story. There is a jackpot story, Mary Jane is jackpot, with art by Todd Nock, which yep. I love seeing Todd Nock's art on this. There is a Wolverine story with uh, Paulo Rivera. There is a Ben Riley chasm story that is really interesting, and I'm not sure what it's leading to, but uh, that is with Patrick Gleason on art, which is beautiful. And then there is a story with Mark Buckingham, who I love from stuff like Fables, uh, telling a story that does seem to lead a little bit, just the tiniest little bit, into the stuff with Doctor Doom going forward. Uh, not like required reading or anything, but it does hint at that. But overall, this is uh, an oversized issue that is the end of Zeb Wells' run. I do believe John Romita Jr. is, they said he's not gone, yeah. but... Maybe a, a long break before well, he comes back. It's Ed McGinnis on this next Eight Deaths of Spider Man storyline. Yeah. Uh, but I do think Ramita Jr. is coming back after that, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah like the, but they, that's pretty far in the future. Yeah, that's, that's eight issues away. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yep. Yeah, if you have been enjoying it or are been reading it, this is going to be an oversized issue coming at you. This is your A cover by Ramita Jr. Some great variants for this. We've got this beautiful Adam Hughes cover with Black Cat and Jackpot. We've got a uh, Alessandro Capuccio cover, the Doom variant. I think that's a Bon Coelho, isn't it? Oh, is it? Um, I thought that was... Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I think I looked on the yeah. inside, and I think I'm right. But maybe I'm not. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but, yeah, the Doom variant, yeah. which I want to read that story. Yeah, that's that's the one I... Pre well, you might get to in the next <laughs> yeah. issue, yeah. We have a Platt cover. And we also have this Oops. Whoop, 1 in 25 uh, cover for $14.99, which is really cool. I love that. Yeah, that one's great. Yeah.
All right, and while I pick up my comments. <laughs> well, I've actually only got one more left. This is Action Comics number 1073. This is part four of the Phantom storyline. Because remember, this series is uh, weekly for the next three months. So we're getting one every single week. So we're already on part four. And in this one, Superman and Mon-El come face-to-face -face with Zadu and Aether. So Zadu is, is you know, the uh, what's his name? Uh, Fan the Phantom Ghost... Yeah, the Phantom Phan King. Phantom King, yeah. yeah. So, But then, you know, there's somebody above him, and that's Aether, and that's kind of like the, the big bad that they're trying to stop in the Phantom Zone. And Superman does try to fight them both, with, but his solar batteries on his wrists, they're getting more and more depleted. He's running out of power, basically. Um, and, you know, so it doesn't really go as well as you might think for him because his power is, is, uh, is getting lower. But we do see how he winds up on Krypton in the past, which is, you know, the I think we saw the cover of next issue is Superman uh, talking to his parents who are young on Krypton. And we see how that all works out in this issue. So, you know, you won't be confused if you read this. But yeah, just the next part of this Phantom storyline. I've been really enjoying it. It's fun having Action Comics be coming out every single week. I wish more books would be weekly. Yeah. I know that's easier said than done, but you know, my pie in the sky wish is that we get these, these uh, stories every week. But uh, there's your A cover right there with Monel. He does not appear in his classic costume in this. Uh, we also have this, uh, let's see, uh, Ibrahim uh, Mustafa cover, and that's Superman facing off against Aether. This is the uh, uh, Wes Craig and Mike Spicer cover. And then we have this 1 in 25 uh, Mark Spears cover that we're selling for $14.99. Next up, I've got Violent Flowers, issue number two. Uh, just real quick about this one. I really like the first one. This kind of weird supernatural uh, book by Maria Lovett that focuses on vampires, but... There are other supernatural things in here. We've got Cornelia, who's a vampire. Her brother, who is the protector of all of these occult creatures, uh, was murdered. And now she is out to find who did it. And she thinks she knows who it is. It's a former uh, kind of love interest of hers. But she heads to this supernatural party where uh, she thinks if anyone knows where this person is that she's hunting down, uh, they'll know there. And this is, I mean, I thought you'd be, see like werewolves and that kind of stuff. There's some weird creatures here. Okay. Just like anything from weird tentacle monsters to a lady who just has like a rhinoceros horn. <laughs> it's just all over the place, but really, really interesting. And, you know, even at this party, no one's to be trusted and no one is safe. Uh, the, the hosts of this party are these triplet kind of fish people. Really, really cool. Really weird. But I liked it. Uh, so if you're a fan of Maria Love It, you know what you're getting with this. And it's all good. So there is your A cover by Maria Love It. You've got this Maria Love It variant cover. And you have a uh, 1 in, I believe it's a 1 in 10 uh, Maria Love cover that we are selling for $11.99. So very cool in there. Are you all out of books? I'm done, yeah. Wow. Next up, it's a it's a fifth Wednesday of the month. It's a it's a weird week for comics and a weird week for our show. Like we got out of balance, yeah. Know, so yeah, my books got out of balance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, I have Star Wars: The Battle of Jakku Insurgency Rising number three. This is a great one. Continuing this series, uh, these rebels uh, that were sent out on this mission have been captured, and uh, but they have help from someone on the inside of the Empire. But maybe that's not good enough because uh, there is a new Inquisitor. That shows up and this is a big deal because you pretty much the inquisitors seemingly phased out by the time of the uh a little bit into the original trilogy i know they're around in rebels and that kind of thing but uh, we don't really know where they are after the fall of the empire and so we're introduced to one here but we don't even know what they look like they're very shadowy and hopefully we'll find out more about them later plus we get to see um commander bra i Brog, Bra, I'm not sure. He's this big, Bra. He's this big guy over here that's like this the big armor and everything. We get to see him in action, plus some cool stuff with Luke. So uh, another really cool issue of Battle of Jakku. That is your A cover. And we also have this Mike McCone variant with Luke. 
And we have our Sprouse uh, Phantom Menace 25th Anniversary. We are up to 24 of 25. One Ooh, more very close. of these. And then next up, I've got Ultimate X-Men issue number... Eight. Eight. Uh, this one's... Once again, they introduce more characters in this one. And just kind of one-off uh, scenes that are interesting. Plus, uh, there was in the previous issue, Psylocke. I don't remember what her name is in this. Well, it's it's K N K A N O N. Yeah. But you know, in the six one six, it's Quanon K W A N N O N. So it's a little variation of that, but it's Canon. Yeah, in this. Canon and her brother in the previous issue found this. Who is a cop? Have found like this briefcase washed up on shore. They open it, and it's seemingly a body inside of it, yeah. though it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but apparently. Uh, even though like these agents, I think it was Viper showed up and mm -hmm. was basically like signed this NDA. You didn't see anything. That doesn't matter. Psylocke, Psylocke is just like, oh, I told people. Yeah. And uh, I think she posted a video or something. She, yeah. She posted something but online. It starts to spread. Yeah. Um, but now they are not safe. But yeah, we get a uh, new mutant that seems to have a like, fire touch power. Maybe it's like Pyro or something like that. There's another character that seems like they can like release kind of a smoke form from within their body plus it seems like the cult the children the atom are getting even crazier yeah and uh it feels kind of like the big story going on in this one but yeah another interesting issue plus you do see the um cyclops girl i don't remember her name is but you do see her use her power kind of yeah yeah the a little kind of the blast but it which, still doesn't look like that on the cover though it you know, looks different. It's very, uh, it's a little more pinpoint yeah. on everything. But, yep, that is Ultimate X-Men number eight. And we've got some variants for that. So we've got this uh, Casanovas variant, which is a Jim Lee homage. It's going to be a connecting cover. We have a 1 in 25 Torn Clark variant. We're selling for $14.99. And lastly, we also had an issue of NYX. NYX number four came out. And this one uh, focuses on Prodigy, who is now kind of a, a teacher at a school. And he's kind of grappling with, like, how much X-Men do I want to be at this point? <laughs> right. uh, you know, he's a teacher, but this is, this is a teacher that kind of... Uh, the one he, that Cuckoo's mouthed off to in the first issue. Yeah, he's a teacher, but he just basically he just wants to teach. Yeah. Like, he doesn't really want to get mixed up in a lot of mutant craziness yeah. anymore, I don't think. Um, plus, in this, Kamala Khan thinks she knows who the Krakoan is, this guy that on guy. the cover. Yeah, that guy and she thinks she's figured out his methods or like where he's going to strike next. Uh, and she basically warns about that. So, will anyone come to her aid? Uh, that's kind of what this one is all about as she does have a pretty big throwdown with him, uh, in the city street. So that's pretty cool as well. That is your A cover. And then we also have a Inhyuk Lee variant. And that is it for our show. Mm -hmm. That is it for our early comics review video for this week of very uh, different stuff, one shots and and mini series and yeah. that kind of thing coming out this week. So hopefully you know a little bit better when you go into your store or infinityflex.net. You know what you're looking for. You won't be too surprised when you see something like a penguin special. What's inside of it? Well, you found out here. So uh, head on over there while supplies last because as always, supplies are limited and we don't want you to miss out on any of these awesome books. Uh, stay tuned for our show coming up on Wednesday where we'll be going over uh, books that you can pre-order by the weekend so you get an early start on that. And We're also doing a, another live episode of our Infinity Flex Letters page on Wednesday as well. We're back on schedule with um, after our bonus episode last week. <laughs> now we're on our regular schedule again this week. So if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, leave them in the comments of this or any other video, and we will compile those together and uh, talk about them on Wednesday. Absolutely, and there's always plenty of stuff to talk about. Oh, yeah. But we love to hear what is on the top of your mind, so leave that in the comments. And until next time, see, see ya. ya.